Hey, well, uh, my name is Brandy, and I live in Northern California. I'm a registered nurse, and I work as an educator uh, for a medical device company. I love to travel. Um, prior to my diagnosis, I was kind of really into fitness. And yeah, I have a, a six-year-old big fat orange tabby cat named Toby and a uh, wonderful boyfriend named Brad, who is a high school math teacher. So I had always kind of had um, painful menstrual periods, like since I was a teenager, and I had a family history of fibroids and endometriosis. So I always kind of suspected that there was something um, unusual going on, um, but doc you know, doctors weren't concerned over the years. There wasn't ever any like evidence of anything wrong. And, you know, they told me, hey, you probably do have endometriosis, but we have to do a surgery to confirm that. So we're just going to assume you do. And, you know, if, if it gets to the point where you need to have a surgery, then we can confirm it that way. So um, fast forward to the summer of 2021, um, I started having like heavier, more painful menstrual periods, which was really unusual. Um, a sensation of like fullness or like kind of bloating in my pelvis. And, um, I, and then what kind of really spurred me to like go in to see a doctor emergently was that I started having severe urinary urgency and, you know, I have a, a bit of a medical background. So I kind of like, you know, I'm running through my head of what the different possible scenarios are here, but like never, ever never crossed my mind that it could potentially be cancer. I just assumed, hey, I probably have a fibroid. You know, I'd been told years ago that I had a teeny tiny one. So I just assumed that it was related to that. So um, I ended up getting rushed into surgery. And, you know, at this point, we're still, cancer's still not on the radar. Um, <clears throat> I had a large uh, cyst on my ovary, which funny that that didn't like raise the alarm bells for me initially because it, it you know didn't even occur to me that that could be malignant um but they ended up having to remove my ovary in this surgery because the the cyst was like solid basically and um you know everything came back benign it was fine but the doctor says what do you want to do about this large fibroid in your uterus and at the time i had just turned 38 I just turned 38 and I wasn't interested in having children. And so I just, <clears throat> I just told the doctor, Hey, let's have a hysterectomy. I, you know, I know fibroids can come back if we, if we do something else and I don't want to deal with it. I just want to do like a one and done, get it out. So, um, I had an elective hysterectomy and, um, a couple weeks later I got a phone call from the clinic saying, Hey, do you have time this afternoon for a video visit with your surgeon? And, and then I kind of, at that point, I kind of knew something was up. So he gets on the call with me and he tells me, I'm sorry, but your pathology report came back and it was not a fibroid. It was a sarcoma. And he just kept saying, wow, I haven't, he, he even mentioned, I haven't seen this in decades. So, um, he told me that he would be referring me to an oncologist. And so that's kind of where it all began. Um, at the time we were kind of hopeful that, you know, this tumor, this sarcoma tumor was confined in my uterus and now my uterus was gone. So maybe this is it. Maybe this is my whole cancer story, you know? Um, but come to find out a couple months later, the oncologist decides that she wants to remove my remaining ovary because the tumor had estrogen receptors, kind of like some breast cancers do, like a hormone sensitive. So I um, elected to have that ovary removed. And when she went in to do that, she found metastatic implants throughout my pelvis of, and they were confirmed to be sarcoma. So I think there were probably about six little tiny nodules throughout my pelvis. They were attached to my um, peritoneum, my bowel. Um, one was on my diaphragm and they removed them all, but there was one small little piece that they left behind that was on my colon because the surgeon, um, she was a gynecologic oncologist. She told me that she was concerned about damaging my colon. And so she didn't want to mess with it basically. So I woke up from surgery. They told me this news. And I remember the, the fellow came to talk to me and she just said, 
I'm so sorry. And I was kind of still hazy coming out of anesthesia and she put her hand on my, on my arm and she goes, I'm so sorry. Nobody deserves this. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, and then, you know, I, I did, I still was like, not fully with, you know, with it, what was going on. And she goes, you know, we found, we found more cancer in your pelvis. So we're going to have you start chemo in three weeks. And at that point I was still like, okay, all right, we got this. Like I did, you know, I'm going to do this chemo and, and, you know, um, and it, it's going to be what it is, you know, and then it turns out that, you know, it's sarcoma and <laughs> sarcoma doesn't really, at least not my type. I have what's called leiomyosarcoma. It's a cancer of, um, smooth, the smooth muscle basically. So, um, it, it, it's pretty much resistant to treatment. So, uh, I, I did at that point, about four months, six rounds of, uh, gemcitabine and docetaxel, which I was, I had an allergic reaction to that was really fun. Um, but I did, I did the whole 12 infusions, six cycles of that chemo regimen, and then the tumor doubled in size. Um, so it was, it did nothing. So at that point they decided that they were going to start me on a more aggressive chemotherapy that required me to be hospitalized for five days every three weeks. So I started then um, some notorious drugs that a, lot, that a lot of people have probably used. They use it in a lot of other cancers too, but um, doxorubicin or what they call the red devil and um, ifostamide, which can cause damage to your bladder, which is part of the reason why I had to be hospitalized and monitored closely while I was having the chemotherapy. So. I did three rounds of that, you know, it was, so it was about nine weeks, 15 days or so in the hospital for those chemo infusions. And, uh, they sent me for a scan and it doubled in size again. So it was just not, I was not having it. <laughs> so at this point they start kind of weighing the different options. Like, all right, it's starting to invade your bladder. It's invading your sigmoid colon. Um, we need to see if this, if, the, if we can go in and remove this, if this looks like a surgery, that's not going to cause a ton of damage to your insides. We want to get it done and get you back on another chemo. Um, so I go for an MRI and it shows that there's just too much invasion into my internal organs that if they do a surgery, it's not going to be straightforward. It's going to be a long recovery. It's going to delay me getting onto another systemic therapy. So they decide at this hospital that it's not the right that they don't want to operate basically. Um, but I was at this point, I was pretty freaked out. <laughs> I mean, rightfully so. Right. Um, that I had failed two chemo regimens and, um, they just wanted to put me on a third and I'm thinking, what's the chances of that doing anything at this point, you know? So I got on a plane and I went to Houston to MD Anderson and I saw a team of specialists there that only treat sarcoma which I guess that was my first mistake is the doctor I had been seeing through all my chemo was not a sarcoma specialist. Um, so kind of sometimes I wonder if things would have, have played out differently if I had been with a sarcoma specialist from the beginning. But, um, but basically the team at MD Anderson said, um, we're going to get some more scans. We're going to go to the, bring this to the tumor board and then we're going to call you and let you know what we think we should do next. So a few days later, I get a call and they decide that they think radiation is the best way to go. So I go through 25 fractions of radiation. I go every single day and um, the doctor actually it's the first time that anybody has given me, me any hope. She's, she's telling me, Hey, I've seen your type of tumor respond to radiation before. You know, she explained how they were dosing it, um, in a way that it was going to cover a margin around the tumor that would reduce the risk of it recurring by like, she said 50%. So I was like on cloud nine, I'm thinking, okay, I finally figured out something that's going to work. Um, but even as a nurse, I didn't realize how devastating radiation can be to your body. So I tolerated it pretty well, like while I was going through it, but, um, it, uh, damaged my bladder pretty severely. And I start having bowel issues. I start having, um, urinary incontinence 
And I'm thinking, okay, this is just a means to an end. So they scheduled me for surgery. Um, I went out a few days early. They did scans. They did a bunch of tests. And I show up on the morning of my pre-op, the day before this surgery is supposed to take place. And the surgeon tells me, I'm sorry. It looks like your tumor is grown and I can't operate on you. So, um, you know, my mom had flown out with me. It was like, it was probably like the lowest point for me right there was, I was feeling pretty hopeless. Like I went through all of this so that you could get this thing out of me. And at this point it was 12 centimeters. It was huge. It was uncomfortable. It was crushing my bladder. Um, I was having bowel issues. I was, um, I was getting obstructed and I was just miserable. And I'm thinking at this point, if if these surgeons at this top hospital are not comfortable operating on me, then I'm a goner. Like this is it. But during those six weeks, I went and got more opinions. So I went, um, I saw a doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then I saw a doctor at City of Hope. And um, the team at City of Hope brought my case to the tumor board and found out that there was actually a surgeon there who does nothing but operate on soft tissue sarcoma. And funny story. Like, I felt like it was all kind of like serendipitous because when I was first diagnosed, I was looking on social media for other sarcoma patients or other stories that would kind of help guide me through what I was going through. And I came across a surgeon and his Instagram name was Sarcoma Surgeon. And it turns out that that's the surgeon who said that he would be able to help me. <laughs> so at this point, I'm thinking everything is aligning. Like, this is, this is, the, this is meant to be like, this guy's going to save my life. And so <clears throat> April 12th of 2023, I went down and had an almost 14 hour surgery. There were five different surgeons involved. So Dr. Sang from, he was the sarcoma oncologist um, at City of Hope, led the team. Um, there was a, one or two urologists, a gynecologic surgeon, and then they had to do a colostomy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a, I have a diverting colostomy. So there was a colorectal surgeon involved and then, a, and then they ended up having to call in a vascular surgery because the tumor was fused to the neurovascular bundle in the left side of my pelvis. So my major artery in my pelvis was severed and they had to graft it and repair it because the tumor was fused to it. So the tumor was stuck to my sigmoid colon and it was, it was not grown into my colon, but it was smashing it so severely that nothing could pass through. So they ended up having, the surgery was supposed to be April 20th and they ended up, I went down for my pre-op and I saw the surgeon and I was like, Hey, the things are not moving. Uh, and, and, uh, he admitted me to the hospital right then and there. And I had surgery the next day. So it, it was actually was, I was brought in emergently. The surgery was supposed to be over a week later. So, um, so they got, they had to remove a piece of my sigmoid colon. They had to remove half of my bladder. Um, the tumor was attached to my left distal ureter, which is the tube that goes from your kidney to your bladder. And, um, so they had to remove part of that. And then my ureter wasn't long enough to reach my bladder anymore. So they had to reroute my ureters so that they kind of funneled into one. <laughs> and so basically my insides have been like my Um, and then of course they grafted the, the arterial, um, damage to the, to the artery in my pelvis. And I spent two days in the ICU. <clears throat> and then I spent about 10 days total in the hospital before they let me go. And then they wouldn't let me go home, home to Northern California for another month because they were just wanted me to be close by. So yeah, so there I was. Um, I had a tube in my back draining my kidney. I had a nephrostomy tube. I had a drain in my abdomen. I had a catheter in my bladder. So I had all these tubes coming out of me and they sent me home that way for about a month and before they finally let me go home to Northern California. So after the surgery, um, the surgeon comes and talks to me and says, hey, we got the whole, the whole tumor out with clear margins, but with sarcoma, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, you know, there could be microscopic cells floating throughout your bloodstream that are just waiting to reimplant somewhere else. And I don't tell you that to scare you, but that's the reality. And I want you, I want you to be aware. So, um, so then I follow up a few weeks later with my medical oncologist and he says, hey, I consider you to be cured. So it was like elation at this point. Like this was June of 
2023 at this point, and I'm being told that I'm cured from stage four sarcoma. Um, and I told, I told him, then <laughs> this makes me laugh. I told him, I said, like, okay, okay. So, you know, I know we're going to continue with the scans every four months. Um, I'm just going to be cautiously optimistic because I understand the risks of this returning. And he says, no, 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 you should be grotesquely optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was just, you know, we celebrated. There was a big celebration at this point. <laughs> so uh, fast forward to September, I come back from my first scans and uh, there is a nodule in my lung. So it has spread to my lung at this point. So just three months later. Um, but my doctor is still very optimistic. He said, look, it actually looks like that nodule has been there for a long time. I went back and looked at your old scans. It's just decided to grow a little bit. And it, it was still less than a centimeter. It was tiny. He said, we're not going to mess around. We're not going to wait and see what this turns into. I'm sending you to a thoracic surgeon and we're having that piece of your lung removed. So then in October, I went in and I had a thoracoscopic uh, pulmonary wedge resection. And so they went in and removed the top part of my left lung with the tumor. It was confirmed to be metastatic sarcoma, um, but they got it all out. And turns out that's kind of like <clears throat> the best case scenario for me is if something pops up and it is operable then that's the plan because we know that I don't really respond to chemo. So, um, so yeah, I had the piece of my lung removed and then my most recent scans were on January 4th, 2024, and they were perfectly clear for the first time since I started this whole journey. So I think part of the reason why I like to be so open about what I've been going through is one sarcoma is a rare cancer and a lot of people don't know what it is. And they hear the word sarcoma, they don't necessarily know that it's cancer or what it affects. Um, but it's basically makes up less than 1% of all diagnosed cancers and there's over 80 subtypes. So, um, there's not a lot of research. There's not a lot of treatment options. Um, so I like to, I like to talk about what I've been through to raise awareness for sarcoma. But the other thing that's, um, that I'm trying to raise awareness for is the fact that when you get diagnosed with cancer, your whole life changes and it's not as simple as, Hey, I'm going to do this chemo or have this surgery. And then I'm going to go on my merry way and put this in, put this behind me for most people. That's not the case. So all of the treatments that I've been through have left me with some pretty significant impairments. Um, I have pretty severe neuropathy in both feet and damage to a nerve in my left thigh. So I have a lot of loss of muscle and I'm after, you know, it's been about nine months since the surgery. So I have been able to regain a lot of strength, but for a while I was falling a lot. And at one point I even fell and broke my wrist last summer. So I just had a lot of instability, the feeling of not being able to kind of feel your feet, like your feet feel like they're asleep, like pins and needles 24 seven. So that's pretty uncomfortable, but like I said, I'm alive. <laughs> um, the other thing, um, you know, the, the colostomy has not been an issue at all. Like they told me that it would potentially be reversible. I don't even care. The very first time that the word was mentioned to me by my care team that this was a possibility. Hey, we might have to do a colostomy. It will probably be temporary. I did everything I could to mentally prepare myself for that. So I went on Instagram. I started following people who have colostomies, um, watching their day-to-day -day life, watching how they dress, how, you know, how do they manage it? How do they maintain it? And it really helped me kind of wrap my head around, like, look at these women living these lives. They're in swimsuits. They're wearing cute clothes. They're out doing this, this and that. And nobody has to know that they have a loss to me. I can do this. So when I went in for the surgery, they, they still didn't know if I would need it or not. It was kind of going to be, it was going to be a surprise when I woke up. But when they told me, I wasn't upset like not even a little bit. I was like, okay, this, you guys did what you had to do to save my life. It's honestly improved my quality of life. 
Um, I don't mind it at all. It's not hard to to manage. Most people would not know it was there if I didn't tell them. And the people who do are people who are probably know what to look for because they're medical professionals and that I encounter in my day to day life, right? So um, nobody needs to know it's there if I don't tell them. Um, but I've had a pretty significant injury to my bladder, so I was left after all of the radiation and the surgery. Um, a fistula, a hole developed in, in my bladder. Um, so has left me with pretty severe urinary incontinence, um, which is kind of really difficult for a woman in her late thirties who likes to travel and do things. I've been kind of confined to, um, managing that. Um, I, I spent about four months with a catheter in my bladder last year. Um, We've tried a lot of things to get it to heal. Um, I saw a specialist who attempted to repair it. And um, the tissue of my bladder and vaginal tissue is just so severely damaged from all the radiation and the surgery that it, it didn't, the repair did not work. So at this point right now, I am uh, getting ready to have an ileal conduit surgery, which is um, a urostomy. So I'm now going to have, I'm going to have two ostomies, <laughs> but, um, but we decided that this was the quickest way to just get me my quality of life back. Um, so I can get back to traveling, going on girls trips, getting in a swimsuit and not having to worry about urinary incontinence or having a catheter. Um, so I'm hoping that that's going to take place probably within the next six weeks. And this is my new normal, but if you're ever diagnosed with sarcoma, the very first thing you do is search for a sarcoma center at a hospital that specializes, that has a cancer center and within that cancer center has a sarcoma center. Um, sarcoma does not behave the same way as your traditional, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer. It's its, its own beast and it requires somebody who knows exactly how it behaves and how how to treat it. So, um, I think, you know, I probably, I, I, I do kind of wonder what if, like, what if I had been seeing a sarcoma specialist from the get go, but it's really important to get multiple, multiple opinions from places who specialize in sarcoma. I would say, you know, in addition to making sure that you find a specialist for sarcoma, if you're diagnosed with it, um, it's just, uh, it's important to know that once somebody is treated for cancer and they receive um, clear, you know, clear scans or they're told that they have no evidence of disease, um, that they still need support. It doesn't just end right there. Um, I'm going to continue to be scanned every four months, probably for the rest of my life. And I have to deal with that paralyzing fear every time. And and I have all of these these now disabilities um, to deal with and these complications to deal with. I, I mean, if you're comfortable, ask your doctor for some, there's medications to help with this. Um, it, and it's okay to not be able to deal with it all on your own. Um, I, I take medication for anxiety when I go in for scans. And usually I have to start taking it a few days before the scans. Um, and I, I just, those are the only appointments that I absolutely must have somebody with me for. And this might be different for other people, but you know, I can, I can show up to surgery alone. It doesn't scare me. I can go sit in a chemo chair alone. It's fine. Um, but when I'm going to have the doctor deliver my scan results, I need to have somebody close to me with me. Um, it's, it's just the way it is. And so support from a loved one, a little help from pharmaceuticals and I just do my best to remind myself that whatever the result is, we will take the next steps and deal with it.